Howdy folks, this is Jimmy Aiken, and I wanted to let you know about a special offer. When you become a patron of the Cordial Catholic Podcast at $8 or more a month, Keith will send you a copy of my new book, The Bible is a Catholic Book. To become a patron, just go to patreon.com slash cordial catholic. Hi, hey, welcome to the Cordial Catholic, a podcast for non-Catholics, new Catholics, and those looking to dig deeper into the Catholic faith. I'm Kay Albert Little, a non-denominational evangelical convert to Catholicism, and this podcast is born out of one particular idea. To fill in the gaps between what you think you know about Catholicism and what Catholics actually believe. As I was looking into the Catholic faith as a non-denominational evangelical Christian, I realized that what I thought I knew about Catholicism was often... I found out, completely wrong, completely backwards sometimes. And in fact, the Catholics around me thought the same thing as me. We were all wrong, completely misinformed. So this podcast aims to fill in those gaps. We have real Catholic conversations with real Catholic thinkers from the heart of the Catholic Church. No misinformation here. And I've got to say, friends, I am so excited about this week's conversation. I am joined by prolific, best-selling author Mike Aquilina to talk about the early church. And to answer the question, was the early church the Catholic church? Some of the things that you will hear Mike talk about, some of the conclusions that we reach from digging into the earliest sources of Christian history are pretty profound. We tackle some very particular Catholic ideas, like relics and baptism and what the first Mass looked like. These things that are uniquely Catholic that, as Mike explains to us, can be found in the earliest church. Was the early church the Catholic church? I think the answer is fairly succinct and fairly profound. This podcast is brought to you in part by my patrons. These are the core supporters of the show, and I have a new patron to welcome this week. Welcome and thank you to Francis B. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, Francis, and all of my patrons for supporting the work that we do here. If you want to give even $1 a month, go to patreon.com slash cordialcatholic, where anything helps to keep this show going. Any financial support is so welcomed. If you want to give $8 or more a month, I can send you a copy of Jimmy Aiken's new book, The Bible is a Catholic Book. It's a fantastic introduction for Catholics or non-Catholics new to the Bible, but I promise everyone will learn something new. It is, I think, the best book written on the subject. In less than 200 pages, Jimmy goes through the history of the Bible, how to read the Bible, and why the Bible is a decidedly Catholic book. It's fantastic. And $8 or more a month, I can send you a copy. It's all at patreon.com slash cordialcatholic. And now, without any further ado, here's my fantastic interview with Mike Aquilina on the early church. Please listen and enjoy. Hi, friends, and welcome back to The Cordial Catholic. I am very excited for my discussion this week because I am joined by Mike Aquilina. Mike is the Executive Vice President of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, an award-winning author of more than 50 books on Catholic doctrine, history, and beliefs, including The Fathers of the Church, The Mass of the Early Christians, The Resilient Church, and What Catholics Believe. His works have been translated into many different languages, and he's also the host of 11 television series and several documentaries digging into church history and all kinds of early church and other topics as well. Mike, I am so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. Welcome and hello. Hey, thanks for the invitation, Keith. 
Yeah, you know, I'm a bit of a, a bit of a history uh, nerd, I guess you should say. So these topics are often some of my favorite ones to discuss. So I'm very excited to have you on the show. Well, thank you. I'm a history nerd too. That's how I got into this business. I think there are a lot of us, you know, uh, uh, out there, and uh, and we just have to have to find each other, find the uh, the opportunities for indulging this nerdiness. <laughs> You know, I was always interested when I and I've I talked to different apologists uh, about different ways of doing um, apologetics and the you know the, the whole thought and it's never occurred to me I guess early on when I began writing and 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 blogging and, and that kind of thing but the idea that there are different sorts of apologetics there's I mean you do theological you you could do. Um, apologetics around uh, the miraculous, and you can do apologetics around looking at history, right, as a certain branch of Catholic apologetics. Well, that's certainly true, and it's the way a lot of um, a lot of people have come into the church. You know, Cardinal Newman said uh, more than a century ago that to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. He read his way into the church and reasoned his way into the church um, by way of the fathers. You know, he he uh, he was a he was an intense reader of the fathers of the church. He was a translator of the fathers. He was a great student of the fathers, and they showed him uh, a church that he did not recognize in his own. Um, his own communion at that time. So, um, so he found his way to Rome, and he made the statement at the end of his his essay on the development of Christian doc- doctrine um, that you know we're Saint Jerome or Saint Athanasius to suddenly find himself alive in our time. There's no doubt about what church they would attend, the one they're most familiar with, and it would be the Roman Catholic Church. Now Newman started that book. He started writing it as a Protestant, but he finished it as a Roman Catholic, and uh, and and many others have followed that path. Uh, many have come in by way of by way of the Father's witness. I can I can remember several years ago when um, the Coming Home Network was was celebrating a milestone. They had welcomed their one thousandth pastor, Protestant pastor, into the Catholic Church. One thousand. And at the time, I asked Marcus Grodi, I said, um, I said, out of that thousand, how many came in by way of the fathers? And he said, hmm, out of a thousand, a thousand. <laughs> so I think there are a whole lot of history buffs out there. Many of them are not Catholic, and many of them really are just waiting to encounter the Catholic faith as it's manifest in the early Christians, the fathers of the church. Yeah, that's then that's absolutely true. And as a, I mean, I was a history major in my undergraduate, so I came to it kind of uh, naturally. The interest in interest in history, I should say. But e- even you know, and I took early, I took uh, history of Christianity courses. Uh, you know, several of them, in fact, but I, I somehow missed out on this narrative. And, and when I discovered the the earliest church, something that you write a lot about, and we're going to, going to dig into just in a moment here, I was just, <laughs> it, it completely blew my mind because it was a completely different narrative from what I uh, understood as a non-Catholic Christian. It had been taught, in fact, in several of these undergraduate courses. I, it, it was completely different from my understanding of the church. So, Let's let's dig into that uh, right away, and I want to start with first looking at maybe some of the sources because this idea that that I certainly had that the early church was a kind of a ragtag group of evangelists hiding out in caves and meeting in upper rooms in in secret and lacking any kind of organizational framework or hierarchy, you might say, and and not anything like the ritualistic Catholic Church we we see now. And, you know, as recently as a few months ago, I listened to something very similar preached on a Sunday morning at a non-Catholic Christian church I was visiting. So this idea is still very prevalent, and it's the fundamental idea that the Catholic Church um, is, is certainly nothing like what the early church was like and not what Jesus intended it to be. So I want to dig into this idea as far as we can go, but I want to begin by asking you this. And that is, how do we know what the early church looked like? Before we dig into anything, what sources do we have for understanding very early Christianity? A few years back, I was sitting on a transatlantic plane flight, and uh, and I was sitting next to 
uh, to this woman, and uh, she told me she had just retired as a research librarian at an evangelical seminary. She had been there all of her professional life, and um, and you know she was very excited about her work as a research librarian. And she told me she taught research methods to seminarians for all those years. She asked me what I what I did, and I, I told her that I write about the early church and. Um, and uh, she said, what do you mean by the early church? I said, yeah, for the first few centuries. Uh, and she said, do we even have any documents from that era? I'm thinking, wow. She has been working as a research librarian all this time, and she does not know about the writers we call the apostolic fathers. The apostolic fathers were those who probably knew the apostles themselves. They wrote uh, for the generation of the apostles and the generation immediately afterward, they're 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 men like like uh, Ignatius of Antioch, who followed Peter as the bishop of Antioch in Syria, uh, Clement of Rome, who was a disciple of Saints Peter and Paul, uh, Polycarp of Smyrna, who was a disciple of the apostle Saint John. You know these were men who were in touch with that apostolic generation. They knew the immediate witnesses of, um, of, of, the, of, the, of the revelation, of, of the incarnation of, of, um, of our Lord, Jesus Christ. So, so these are important witnesses in the historical record. They seem very much aware of, uh, of the scriptures as we know them today, and they're expounding those, and they're, they're preaching the gospel in a way that's recognizable. They're also talking about a church that is hierarchical. There's the office of bishop, the office of presbyter, priest. There's the office of deacon, and it's there from the very beginning, this, this three-part structure that's uh, that's in every every local church. They are very much aware of um, of the centrality of the Holy Eucharist in the church. They're, they witness to a church that is sacramental, that baptizes, that that uh, that is uh, is centered around around Holy Communion, and they believe Holy Communion to be the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. They believe it to be His flesh and blood, and they use those terms. And they believe in a church that's called. Catholic. Ignatius of Antioch, writing in 107 AD, again, one of our great connections to the generation of the apostles, he calls the church Catholic. Uh, uh, Ken Whitehead, uh, Kenneth Whitehead, wrote a book, a, a, you know, a few few years back, and it was called The Early Church is the Catholic Church, or was the Catholic Church. I forget precisely what the title, what the title is, but um, the early church was the Catholic Church, and I think that's that's true, and we've got to you know, be familiar with those documents so that we can witness to that fact that we are in continuity with the earliest Christians. We are are celebrating our faith in the ways that they did. And when we read the, the scriptures, we read the scriptures the way they read them. Um, there's, there's clear continuity. When I read Clement of Rome or Ignatius of Antioch, I recognize my parish church in all the details, in its sacramentality, in its hierarchy, in, uh, in the, the problems that it faces, and in the ways uh, that my church goes about solving those problems as well. <laughs> you know, it's a very interesting uh, point of fact, I guess. And I was in the same boat, too, is that, you know, even when I would study the, the so-called early church uh, in, say, like adult Bible studies or, or you know, um, these these like Wednesday night uh, church meetings, where we 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 supposedly dig into the, the these deep things of the church as a non Catholic Christian be, before I became Catholic. Um, as an evangelical, we we dig into these things, but it, there was this sense that okay, our information about the early church comes from the Acts of the Apostles and and the epistles, the letters that Paul and Peter and John had had written. But then that was it. There, there was nothing else we could know about the early church except for those things that were in the New Testament. And then, you know, there was this enormous chasm of time between those being written and then me and my local church. And we'd say, oh, it looks kind of the same. We have small groups like they would have had. 
You know, we celebrate communion. We see in the Acts of the Apostles that they're gathering, they're breaking bread in the upper room, and we do that kind of thing. We break bread for communion, even though it's just kind of a symbolic thing. And they sing, they sing hymns, and and we sing hymns, and this looks very, very similar. But we didn't have a sense of, you know, immediately following that uh, and the writing that continued on in the following subsequent two thousand years. Um, we didn't have a sense of that writing. We kind of just stopped at the end of the New Testament, and that was our picture of the church. And we had to try and make our church kind of look as, as close as we could t- to that. Do you get a sense of, of why the sources that, that follow the New Testament are often ignored by non-Catholic Christians? Well, you, you know, uh, it's not only the sources after the New Testament, it's sources within the New Testament. What we often find is a... Um, what we often find is a um, a uh, selective reading of the books of the New Testament, and some are given much more priority than others. Um, uh, we find uh, a lack of of uh, engagement, for example, with First Corinthians seven, uh, which speaks of apostolic celibacy, about about consecrated virginity for the sake of the kingdom. Uh, there's just a lack of engagement, and if you read the the you know non-Catholic commentaries on the Bible, you often find an utter silence about these realities of the early church. Now, if we read the documents of the generation immediately after this, we would know the way the earliest Christians interpreted those passages and engaged with them and lived them out, because we find that there are many celibates and many consecrated virgins in the first and second and third and fourth generation of the Church. We still have them today in the Catholic Church. We find a similar lack of engagement with John chapter 6, the famous bread of life discourse, that that there's just a uh, uh, a glossing over or a suddenly symbolic reading of um, of a text that is graphically realistic in sacramental terms, where Jesus is describing the um, the Eucharist as his real flesh, real blood, which is real food, and. As people challenge him, his immediate his immediate congregation there at the uh, the synagogue uh, challenges him. Uh, he just gets more graphic and 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 uh, and more emphatic that this is the real presence, and we find that many of his disciples left him that day because they said it was a hard saying. Well, it's still a hard saying for non-Catholics. They don't know quite what to do with it, and people who are usually literalists will suddenly become intense intense symbolists. You know, they'll want a symbolic reading of this. They'll want to to allegorize it away. So we find a lack of engagement. We find a selective reading of the New Testament. You'll often find um, non-Catholic Christians denying, for example, that St. Paul wrote the pastoral e- epistles. Why do they do that? Well, you know, they'll say that there are linguistic reasons. But, you know, I think the primary reason is that these these epistles are rather Catholic in their appearance. They are intensely concerned with a sacramental clergy and about uh, the practice of ritual public worship, the liturgy. So so we, we push those aside. We almost push them out of the canon of the New Testament, or we minimize their importance. You know, that's what we often encounter there. We get rid of the, the inconvenient New Testament texts. We are just as keen as Catholics to engage the text of the New Testament, but we don't do it alone. We do it with the Bible study group. And our Bible study group is not limited by our own time and place. We bring the saints into our Bible study group, and we give the early fathers of the church a privileged place in helping us to read the Bible. Why do we do that? Well, for one thing, because they were living in times that were a lot closer to the times of the New Testament. And so they're able to witness to those times in ways that we cannot, and even the way 20th century readers could not. So they can tell us about the games that were played, about the transportation in that time, about the way people dressed, and they can apply it to the New Testament text. We read um the New Testament in a much richer way when we read it with its earliest witnesses. Um, the fathers are also important to us because they are are men and 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 women too. The, if we count the mothers of the church, they are they're witnesses 
who gave the ultimate witness often. Okay, these are some, at least some of them, died as martyrs, and they were willing to lay down their lives. That's a certain proof of Christian seriousness uh, and of Christian earnestness that we should take very seriously. The other thing is that when we read the fathers, we're reading the best interpreters of their time. You know, many, many, many people were writing about Christian matters in the first century, second century, third century. But the only ones who were preserved, or, or most of those who were preserved, carefully preserved, copied out by hand over generations again and again, um, are the best. So when we read the fathers, we can see that that uh, that the early Christians uh, preserved these texts at great risk, at great expense, and at great effort, and they did that for a reason because these were uh, the these were the the witnesses and the teachers who were most revered by the Christian churches. Yeah, you know, I. I never would want to disparage my evangelical uh, upbringing because I, I did receive a, a deep love of Jesus and a deep love and a passion for reading the Bible. But I do feel ripped off sometimes in the sense that we did Bible study, like you, like you've mentioned, in kind of this vacuum of you know the 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 ten of us sitting around with our Bibles open, discussing a number of passages, kind of just ripped from any kind of context of the the all these rich resources we have from the early church you know i think too i had dr doug beaumont on the show a number of times now but when he when he first came on he was working um at southern evangelical seminary and he was working under the late norman geisler who was who was a pillar of evangelical christianity and and doug talked to me about how he was uh he was gathering sources from the early church for uh, for Dr. Geisler's systematic theology textbook. And, and Doug said how he would just kind of present these different quotes, and they were often completely um, bereft of context, but those would get ultimately included in a textbook on systematic theology to kind of bolster up some of these, um, these evangelical Christian um, doctrines. But yet, if we look in the context, if we go back and look at the context that the Bible was written in from the early church sources, look at the context of some of these quotations that we sometimes, that I certainly saw lots of times, pulled out of context to bolster up my evangelical beliefs, if we don't cherry-pick these sources and, and look at them in context, like you say, we see a very Catholic church as the early church, if we're not just cherry-picking out sentences here and there. That's right. Context is very important. Historical context, I would say, is is extremely important, um, and this is the biblical way of of practicing the religion. The you know this is the way of of practicing any biblical religion. Uh, if you if you look at the religion of Israel and the religion of the first Christians, it's it's always described as the God of our fathers. You know this is the religion. This is the way of our fathers. We're practicing and walking the way of our fathers and worshiping the God of our fathers, of Abraham, of Isaac, you know, Jacob and Moses. Um, so we look back to our fathers. We don't forget them. We look back to them. Um, we recognize them. We bring them into our conversation. Uh, we give them a voice today because we value them. This is what the first Christians did. And uh, this is what we continue to do in our own time. Chesterton said that Christians instinctively practice a democracy of the dead, we look back on our ancestors, and we give them a voice even today. This handing on is so important in Christianity, um, and it's, uh, it's still going on today. All right. So, you mentioned earlier uh, the hierarchical structure of the early church, and I want to dig into this for a moment here, because you, you commonly hear the claim, at least I did in, in evangelical, in, in non-Catholic uh, Christian circles, that Christians kind of met in these small groups, a uh, very unorganized fashion. Is there any truth to this claim? I don't see any truth to that claim, and I, I don't see it in the New Testament either. If you look on the birthday of the church, you know, look at Acts 1 and 2, and you read the passages about the, the, that first Christian Pentecost, when, uh, when the Holy Spirit appeared in power, you know, through the, the tongues of flame and the strong wind. Um, what happens on that day? 
it almost seems chaotic. But if you read the text closely, you see that it's not chaotic. It's energetic, yes, but it's not chaotic. There's a certain order to it. Um, there are many people are baptized that day, but who's baptizing? Not everybody's baptizing. You know, Peter seems to be baptizing. There's an awful lot of preaching going on that day, but it's Peter who's preaching. You know, so the baptizing and the preaching, it seems, are, are, um, are reserved to the one who has authority or those who have authority. Um, if we see this, if we read the Gospels, we see that this is the case as our Lord built up the church and, and, uh, and really uh, established its structure, okay? Uh, he, 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 he called many to be disciples, right? Uh, we read about 70 in one, one case, right? So, um, so he called them, and, and among them, there were, there were the 12, right? There were the, the 12 who represented his, his apostles, his, his band. And then even within the apostles, there was an inner circle of three. Now, some people have said that this just reflects a structure that was already there in Judaism, you know, in the, uh, the, 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 the priestly worship. In, at the temple, we find that there's a high priest, and there are priests, there are his assisting priests from the tribe of Levi, and then there are the Levites, who really function the way deacons function today. Um, so, so we have picked up this, this, this biblical uh, structure, and we've, we've carried it into the future. Uh, we observe it still today, and it seems like our Lord had something like that in mind. Uh, and it's, it's, it's definitely there from the beginning because we don't, we don't find this undifferentiated mass of Christians. We don't find it in the upper room, for example. You know, we find Peter guiding the others, uh, through the, 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 uh, the important procedures for replacing Judas. We find then Peter on Pentecost Sunday doing his, his work of preaching and of sacramentalizing the first Christians. And we find Peter uh, in a leadership role as the primary healer of the church and so on, all through the Acts of the Apostles, the primary teacher of the church, the primary judge, the disciplinarian, all of these things we find in Peter. We also find authority exercised by the Apostles. It's not the same kind of authority that's practiced by everyone else in the church. So even from the, the, the New Testament generation, uh, we find a hierarchical church. Uh, as I said before, this is spelled out a bit in the pastoral epistles. Uh, we would get much more clarity and precision with the terminology as, uh, as the first century wore on. But by the time you get to Ignatius of Antioch in 107 AD, we find a writer with the assumption that every single local church will have the hierarchy of bishop, priest, and deacon, that they're all there. Ignatius does not argue for that. He assumes that it's in place. Everybody knows it. It's been that way for a long, long time. And again, this is in 107 AD. And I think the important thing there that you've just underscored for us is he's not arguing for that. He's not saying, okay, Christians, you know, fall under this hierarchy, get, get in order, like get in line here. He's assuming that this already exists everywhere that he is aware of this early on after the church uh, being born, right? Absolutely. You know, that, that's, uh, that's there from the beginning. And he's not even the first to witness to this. You know, Clement of Rome is writing before Ignatius of Antioch. Clement is probably writing, well, it's somewhere between 67 and 97 AD. Uh, 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 the the re most recent wave of scholarship seems to indicate an early dating of Clement, uh, uh, Clement of Rome. Uh, and so that would place him 67 AD very early in the church's history, and not too long after our Lord's ascension to heaven. Uh, that would make him a, an extremely early witness, maybe earlier than, than, than some of the books of the New Testament. So uh, Clement is witnessing to a church that's hierarchical, that, um, that, um, that is obedient to authority, and, and the locus of the ultimate authority in Clement's time was apparently Rome, because Clement wrote his letter to a distant church, the church of Corinth. So he's writing to the Corinthians across the ocean, and he's writing to them not as an equal, but as a father. 
He's writing to them, and he's, he's, he's really writing a letter of discipline to bring them back into line with the, church, with, with the faith they had received from the apostles. So, I mean, I think the important thing, uh, before we move along off this topic of the hierarchical church, is the idea that these early Christians, um, very, very early in the history of the church, understood the church not to be this invisible collection of Christians uh, kind of scattered across the world, or the known world at the time, uh, I suppose, but a very visible hierarchical church that had clear uh, lines between who belonged, who was in, who was out. I mean, it was not this invisible kind of church that certainly I would have understood it to be as an evangelical. It was a visible church. Is that right? It was both invisible and visible. And, and, and by that, we mean it, it was sacramental. You know, the, what, what you saw was, um, was, was indicative of something that was invisible. The earthly was, was shining forth, really, the reality of the heavenly. And so, 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 yes, there was this visible dimension to it at all times. And that visible dimension was sacramental. We find a laying on of the hands uh, in, in the Acts of the Apostles and also in the pastoral epistles. We find that continued in every generation afterwards. And Clement spells out what that means. Again, we have someone who's probably writing, you know, as early as 67 AD, before the fall of the temple. But he witnesses to apostolic succession. He said that the apostles knew they weren't going to live forever, so they, they really did commission those who would come after them and rule in the church so that there would not be contention for authority. And he's explaining this very patiently to the Corinthians. This is the reality from the time of the apostles. It's, it's uh, the inheritance that every Christian church on earth knew that it had. Wow, it's, it's fairly remarkable. <laughs> Okay, so I want to dig into some of the practices of the early church, and I want to start somewhere strange, uh, certainly an area which may completely freak out some non-Catholic uh, listeners, and that's what the early church's understanding of relics was, because this is something so completely foreign to non-Catholic Christianity. I mean, when I was an evangelical Christian, I would have been completely mortified to even think about the subject of, of relics. But didn't relics, you know, a fundamental part of the Catholic identity even today, didn't those play something of an important role in the early church? Well, relics were important even before the advent of our Savior. Relics were important in the Old Testament. And we find that, you know, when, when someone, when a, a dead body is dropped into the grave, that holds the bones of the prophet, right? The the bones, uh, the, the the dead body comes back to life. It's resurrected uh, that way. Um, we find in the New Testament the use of relics that people would take, you know, uh, 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 the handkerchief of, uh, of of Peter or Paul, and they would use that to heal other people. You know, this is a relic. That's what we're talking about here. In the book of Revelation, we find that the bones of, of the martyrs are crying out from under the altar in heaven, and many people believe that that is just reflecting the practice of the church on earth, that we build our altars over the bones of of the dead of of our of our saints from previous generations we still do that today um, we find the most ancient churches are built on tombs look at saint peter's in rome and saint paul's in rome they dug down straight under the altar and what did they find they found the uh the graves of peter and paul with inscriptions in the stone under there so that they were easy easy to recognize this is what we did from from earliest times, from apostolic times. Uh, in, uh, it, 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 there's a, a great document of the second century. It's the the martyrdom of Polycarp. It's called, and it's a description of the death of one of Saint John's apostles, Saint John's disciples. Um, Saint John uh, welcomed Polycarp into the church as a young man. Polycarp eventually became a bishop, and eventually he died as a as a martyr. And his 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 martyrdom was narrated, was set down uh, by an eyewitness who was his secretary. We have that still today. And we find in that document uh, that the pagan authorities knew that the Christians would try to save the relics of the martyrs so that they could venerate them. They could treat them with honor and respect. Um, and so they... Uh, they uh, 
they they uh, they wanted to make sure that that there were there were no remains from Polycarp. So you know they they burned down his bones and so on, and, and then cast them on the river. But the Christians even went that far as to collect what was cast on the river, so that they would they would. Um, they would have the the bones of Polycarp. This is attested uh, in the earliest generations of the church. But again, it should not surprise us because there was great care for the relics of the patriarchs and the prophets in Old Testament times, and we know that their tombs were were venerated by the Jews in the first century, and uh, and and many of those tombs are still venerated today. Uh, this was just what people did. Uh, the the um, the the bones of the Maccabean martyrs, for example, the the, the great uh, Jewish martyrs, um, were preserved very carefully and kept in a place of honor. And it was Christians who later uh, later took those upon themselves and uh, and venerated them in their churches. Uh, that you can you can find them today in the the Church of Saint Peter in Chains in Rome. So, so yes, this is a, this is an ancient practice. It has always been part of biblical religion, and it remains part of biblical religion today in the practice of the Catholic Church, the Orthodox churches, and the other apostolic churches of the East. Yeah, you, you talked earlier about uh, kind of a selective reading of parts of the New Testament, and certainly... I when I began digging into the Catholic Church and the idea of relics, uh, I was often pointed back to the Book of Acts, and you mentioned this briefly. But you know, Saint, we have Saint Paul's handkerchief and Saint Peter's shadow, even as as things that were able to somehow um, dispense or deliver God's grace and, and healing properties to people. Yet I just kind of would have gla- glazed over these passages if I read them as before I became Catholic, but. You know, you talk about even beyond the New Testament into the Old Testament, um, we have this continuous uh, example of physical things being used by um, by Christians and by the Jewish people to to as special important things that God can somehow work through. This isn't some kind of idolatry or some kind of ancestor worship. I mean, this is. A biblical practice, right? Absolutely. You know, we venerate these things because they have they have come into contact with Christ. That's the thing. Um, you know, if you read Second Peter one four, you know, you read there that in baptism we have become partakers of the divine nature. Wow, that is a very mysterious thing. And it's one of the, the ways the fathers love to talk about salvation. We're we're saved from sin. And that's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing to be saved from our sins. But that's just preliminary. That's just preparation. We're saved from sin so that we could be saved for divine sonship. St. Paul says repeatedly that we have come to live in Christ, and Christ has come to live in us. Christ inhabits us, and we inhabit Christ. And Christ is not just a ghost. He's not this spirit who's unmoored. Christ is a man like, like, like you and me in that way, in that he's fleshly. So this, this reality of Christ is incarnate in us. That's why we've always honored cemeteries as holy ground. Why? Because it holds the divinized flesh of the saints. Why are they saints? Well, Not because they've been canonized, because very few Christians have been canonized down through history. Only the most amazing, only the the brightest witnesses whose whose witness um, has been public. No, we call our ancestors saints because they've shared in the life of Christ through baptism, through Eucharist, that they have come to know God's blood coursing through their veins. And, and that's how we live right now, as partakers of the divine nature, as those who share in the life of Christ. You know, uh, Christ said, abide in me, right? He wants us to live in him, and he said he's going to live in us. This is something very real. It's not a metaphor. It's not a symbol. It's very real. So this body we have is something sacred, and this affects all of our doctrine about the body. <laughs> 
and it affects many of our of the doctrines that are in dispute today. Uh, matters of um of 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 the Christian understanding of sex, for example, and gender and reproduction. All of these things are caught up in our respect for the sacredness of the body. Because Christ was incarnate, because he is incarnate, the body is something holy. It's something special. It's even something divine because it partakes in the divine nature. <laughs> That's very well said. So, how about something a little less strange when it comes to Catholic practices? And how about the idea of baptism? Because it, it's controversial in some non-Catholic Christian circles to practice infant baptism. You know, I was baptized, for an example, as a teenager, because it had to be something, according to the Pentecostal church I was a part of, um, a decision that I made for myself. And this was scriptural, we'd argue, and this is how Christ always intended it to be. But as I began digging into the roots of uh, the Christian faith, the, the history of Christianity, um, this was not what I understood and what I realized that the, the early church understood baptism to be. So, what can you tell us about how the very first Christians understood baptism? Well, you know, they understood it they, as a beginning of new life, as a divinization of the person. You know, it's the beginning of a new life. It's a birth. Uh, St. Paul compared it to circumcision, you know, the time when a baby was welcomed into the people of Israel. And so, you know, we look at baptism in the same way. It is, it is the time uh, of a new birth and the time of a welcoming of a new Christian. And, 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 and we know that in the early church, babies could be baptized, uh, and, and often were, uh, that, that people would be baptized with their entire household. Uh, parents had a responsibility in biblical religion for bringing their newborns into into uh, into the people, into Israel, and that was done through circumcision. Parents in the Christian church did the same thing. They made that decision uh, for their, their children because they had that authority. You know, in that world, it was never a certain thing that a child was going to make it out of childhood. Infant mortality, the, the rates were so high, uh, and, and then child mortality uh, rates were so high. So, so the parents took great care to give their children this super, this gift of supernatural life as early as possible and raise them into it. Um, the great study of this actually was done by a Protestant, Joachim Jeremias, a German scholar of, of the last century. And as far as I'm concerned, his study is fairly definitive, you know, in, in demonstrating that the early church practiced infant baptism uh, and, and, uh, and had a, a great theological justification for this. Yeah, I think my favorite uh, apologetic for uh, Catholic, uh, Catholicism being not this works-based religion that sometimes it gets a bad rap for being was uh, Dr. Michael Barber, who's written a fantastic book on, on salvation, what Catholics believe about salvation. He talks about, well, look, we baptize babies and babies can do no work of their own. So obviously we're not a works-based religion. No, no, that's clear. Michael's a great scholar. That's a great book. So, you know... As a non-denominational Christian, I would have thought that the way I worshipped on a Sunday looked a lot like the way the early church would have worshipped. Now, to be fair, this would have taken a lot of mental gymnastics because they certainly didn't have electric guitars or drums or PowerPoint. But, you know, the idea of singing some songs, we'd call that worship music and praying together and, and hearing a sermon we thought, I thought, was how the very first Christians would have, in quotes, done church. But what do the sources tell us about how the early church actually celebrated on a Sunday? Well, you know, we're fortunate to have abundant sources on this subject because liturgy, the ritual public worship of the church, was one of the primary concerns of the earliest authors whose works have survived, the ones I mentioned before. Um, you find that the, the letter of St. Clement um, to the Corinthians uh, is all about liturgy. Liturgy is its central concern. It's it's about um, it's about authority in the church, yes, but it's about it's about authority in terms of roles uh, during during public worship. So you know he's explaining very carefully that in the church, as in Israel, uh, certain people had certain roles. There was a role for the priest, a role for the Levite, and there's a role for the laity. We all need each other. We all need to be there. 
So that's Clement. You know, Ignatius of Antioch, again, makes that sacramental worship uh, one of his central concerns. And again, he's not arguing for it. He's just putting it out there. He's giving them good ascetical advice about living the sacramental life. It's, it's very simple. As we get into the later centuries and we read authors like Justin Martyr, he's writing in 150 AD, and he's writing quite a bit about the Mass and about baptism as they're celebrated in his time. Uh, Justin, uh, Justin wrote this beautiful description of the Mass, and when we wrote, uh, when, when the, the Church uh, published its Catechism of the Catholic Church in the 1990s, it didn't bother to write a new description of the Mass. It just picked up the one that Justin wrote in 150 AD, and it, it just dropped it verbatim into the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Why? Because the Mass we celebrate today is the Mass that was celebrated in Rome in 150 AD. Justin witnesses to it, and Justin is a Christian who had lived all over the world, all over the known world at that time. So he was witnessing to liturgy as it was done in the Christian Church throughout the world. Uh, if you look at the earliest document that we possess outside of Scripture, it's the Didache. The Didache has liturgical portions in it that tell you how to do the ritual of baptism and tell you how to do the ritual of Holy Mass. And again, that document, that liturgical document, scholars tell us, was probably set down sometime before 47 AD. So it's older than almost everything in the New Testament, and its primary concern is sacramental worship. Ritual is not something that was imposed on the church at a later date. It's something that was central to the church from the earliest date, and even before that, because it was central to the religion of Israel. Biblical religion has always been liturgical, and the, the books of the Bible have been canonized for public reading within a sacramental liturgy. That's true of the New Testament, it's true of the Old Testament, and it's true of the Catholic Church today. We are worshiping the way Christians have always worshiped. You know, I think something that was fundamental for me to discover as I was journeying into the Catholic Church was not only how sacramental the early Church was, as you've talked about, but how sacramental God's people have always been. We look back into the Old Testament and see God working through sacramental worship, through the, the combining of the physical and, and the spiritual, the, the natural and the supernatural. This isn't just a thing that... Uh, that Catholics invented, you know, later on in, in the history of the Church. This is something that stretches right back to how God first wanted His people to, to worship Him. Is that fair to say? It is. And if you read the New Testament, you find that again and again, that there were certain rituals that were performed, you know, Acts 2.42, that, that those, those early Christians gave themselves to the teaching of the apostles and the communion the breaking of the bread, and the prayers. And we find the breaking of the bread wherever the Christians go. In the Acts of the Apostles, also in the Epistles. Read 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. It's deeply sacramental. It's a witness to the real presence. Um, and if you read Romans, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, Paul's letter to the Galatians, they are, they are intensely concerned with the sharing of meals. Now, I don't believe, and many scholars uh, don't believe, that, uh, that, that we're talking about ordinary meals, you know, a, a covered dish dinner. Uh, no, we're talking about sacramental meals. We're talking about the Eucharist and the sharing of the table of the Lord. That's a time when we should all be united, rich and poor, um, and uh, Jew and Gentile. And that's Paul's concern. Read, read the letter to the Hebrews. Read the book of Revelation. Read, again, the pastoral epistles to Timothy and Titus. These books are intensely concerned with liturgy, with sacramentality, with hierarchy, with these things that we would think today are distinctively Catholic. They should be distinctively Christian because they're distinctively biblical. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, that we, we find abundant evidence of this sacramentality that God intends to be employed in his divine worship, Old Testament and New Testament. 
You know, I think one of the greatest, for me, uh, apologetics to, or, or reasons why this sacramental life was so compelling was probably the first time, you know, my very first confession. You know, I, I used to, as an evangelical Christian, certainly pray for forgiveness. I did it this often. But you're, you're left with this feeling, and I'm sure that non-Catholic Christians can relate to this. You're left with this, with this feeling of, uh, I do not want to say wishful thinking, but this th- you have to almost ramp up in yourself this feeling of being forgiven. Well, when I first went to confession and uh, received the sacrament of, of somebody, a, a priest, who I believed at the time to be uh, you know, a successor of the apostles and duly appointed and and part of this hierarchy that Christ established and that trickles down all the way to us today. You know, I, I believe that priest has that power. When he said those words that Christ put into his mouth, well, you see this in the New Testament, Christ telling his disciples to, to say these words. When he uttered those words, the sense of forgiveness for me was, and I've heard this from other converts as well, was just so much more tremendous than anything I could ever experience on my own. And that was the moment that that was the moment that I realized that yes, the sacraments, this is this has got to be what what God intended for his church to look like and to practice, right? Yes, absolutely. There's something there's something powerful about about uh, the sensory experience of speaking your sins aloud in the hearing of another human being. Um, who represents Christ to you. Um, and then your hearing of the words of absolution. This is a powerful experience that was known uh, since the early church. You know, we know about auricular confession as it was practiced in the early church, and it was of such importance that disagreements about auricular confession were among the greatest threats to church unity. In early times, not because some people were saying you don't have to confess your sins to a priest, but some people were saying that the penances should be severe, and others were saying that the penances should be light. Others were rigorists, and others were called laxists. Um, um, they were they were advocating for greater mercy, and that was the re- the only real argument about confession in the early church. When we read the New Testament, we find that that um, uh, the the New Testament authors encouraging us to confess our faith. And when they use that word that we translate as confess, they mean speak aloud, confess with your mouth, as we read in St. Paul in his letter to the Romans. And it's the same thing about confessing your sins, to speak them aloud. And, and that's not speaking them aloud, you know, in your basement where nobody can hear it. No, it's speaking them aloud in the presence of another priest, or in, the, in the presence of, a, of another, another human, another person, and specifically someone who has the authority to absolve you in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's another example of that sacramental worship that Jesus Jesus gave us in his mercy because he understands that we are embodied creatures. We're not just spirit. We're spirit and we're body. We have hearing for a reason. Why? You know, what is that reason? Well, so that our hearing can be caught up in worship. We have the sense of smell for a reason. Well, what is that reason? You know, it's so that that sense of smell can be caught up in worship when we, when we use the sensor, when we use incense in our ritual. All of our senses can be caught up in the worship of God, and, and, and that's true precisely because God made us this way, and because God condescended to take on our flesh and share a body like ours. <laughs> Mike, I feel like we're just scratching the surface of this stuff, and this is fantastic. I have one more question to close with, um, because as my wife and I were working our way through the process of becoming Catholic, you know, I was a bit ahead of her, and like many converts before me, I just did a terrible job of communicating my thinking and, and journeying with her. But I remember at one point, we were talking to somebody much older and wiser than us to get a bit of advice about how we could, how I could and do better about communicating and how we could make this journey um, a bit less bumpy as it was at the time. And I remember at one point he asked me why I was so drawn into Catholicism in the first place. And I talked about the history of Christianity and my studies into the early church and how it all looked and sounded very Catholic. And his response to me, I'll never forget it, was, 
well, why would older necessarily be better? And I, I was kind of shocked by a question like that when it came to, to Christianity. But thinking about everything that we've talked about, I wonder how you would answer a question like that. Why a Christianity that looks older, you know, you know, looks more like the early church, why would that be a better version of Christianity? Now, I don't know that it's better, and I don't know that I'd say that um, that uh, that it's better because it's older. But but one thing's for sure um, that uh, that that the the ancient church really does preserve a record of how Christianity was practiced in that time. And, uh, and, and if we look at every age, we will find Christianity practiced essentially the same way, or at least in ways that are in continuity. This is what made a convert of Cardinal Newman in the 19th century. He was, he was a, a man who was steeped in history, and he saw that there was a certain continuity to what was believed and what was practiced in the Catholic Church, that that the, the, the essence of the faith never changed, that what was held by those early Christians was still held today, although sometimes it, it had developed, it had become uh, more uh, ex- explicit, whereas it was implicit early on, um, that the faith does develop, the practices of the faith uh, do develop. But the, the early church really keeps us honest, okay? Because it would be very easy for us to just chase novelties forever, to go after one Christian fad after another, just chase them down the centuries, chase them down the years of our lives, and, uh, and have no discipline on that. You know, when we look at our Christian ancestors, they really do witness to what's essential in the faith, and they, they help us to be cautious about accepting new things. They help us to be cautious about, um, about veering away to what has, from what has always been, been the case in Christianity. Um, uh, I find that to be extremely helpful, because if you look at what has happened to the churches since um, the, the Protestant Reformation, frankly, since there was that rejection of an ultimate authority outside the individual conscience. Well, you know, what has happened since then? We find mutating Christianities out there. We find the the church fragmenting more and more and more, not only every year, but every week. New churches breaking off from old churches and denominations fracturing, splintering, um, until we have tens of thousands of them active today. This is kind of crazy, and it's not what our Lord meant when he said th- that he wished, that he, when he prayed to the Father, that all may be one. You know, we are, we are, we are pulling hard against his prayer at the Last Supper. You know, um, we want to be one, not only in space, but also in time, we want to practice what the first Christians practiced, and and the the early Christians do witness to that, and how that was carried from one age to the next and to every age afterwards. Um, so it's valuable not just because it's old, but because it confirms what we know today. I believe what Cardinal Newman said. If St. Jerome or St. Athanasius were suddenly to find themselves alive today, there's no doubt in my mind about where they would go. They would go to the to the place where the faith would be most familiar to them, and that would be in the Catholic Church. <laughs> That's just a fantastic answer. Thank you for that. Listen, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. I'm so grateful for your time, and thank you. Where can people go to find out more about what you've written and, and dig into some of your things? You've written about a billion books, so where can they go to find all of them? Well, my, my website is fathersofthechurch.com fathersofthechurch.com. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Is there a book you'd recommend out of those books for them to start digging into the history of the early church if they had to pick one to begin with, Mike? Um, Probably the simplest one to begin with would be The Apostles and Their Times, because it looks at the New Testament and it it provides uh, a way of, of segue, really, into the next generation into the time of the Apostolic Fathers. From there, they might go on to read The Fathers of the Church, my, my bigger book about the, the early fathers of the first several centuries of Christianity. That sounds fantastic. Mike, thank you so much for being on the podcast. 
I want to say God bless you, God bless your family, and God bless the fantastic work you are doing for the church. Thank you so, so much. Well, thanks again for the invitation, Keith. I had a good time. (laughs) Me too. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Cordial Catholic. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Mike Aquilina on the early church. Be sure to visit his website at fathersofthechurch.com where you can see some of his videos, his speaking, and buy all of his fantastic books. They're also available on Amazon, and I will link to those in the show notes as well. Those show notes are found in any podcatching app and also at thecordialcatholic.com, where you can also find my blog and some of the articles I have written recently, including an interesting response to the idea of young earth creationism and a literal reading of John 6. Mike alluded to that during our podcast interview, and it's a pretty interesting article. It's gone viral and getting a lot of traction. How can we read one part of the Bible literally and not another? I'm at Cordial Catholic on Twitter, The Cordial Catholic on Facebook, and send your feedback, your emails, complaints, comments, whatever. It's all helpful to cordialcatholic at gmail.com. Please prayerfully consider supporting this show financially to help it keep going at patreon.com slash cordialcatholic. Thanks to those who are already supporting the show. I really appreciate it, and thank you for everybody who's listening, that's you, and praying and fasting for the show, too. That's very important. Thank you so much, friends. I'll see you again next week. Take care and God bless.